Hi there, Duke fans. Welcome to episode 423 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. It's been a little while. We were waiting for some news, and wow, the news came flowing in like a tidal wave over the past oh, couple hours or so. We are talking to you now uh, in the mid to late afternoon on Wednesday the 18th. Um, sorry, Tuesday the 18th. Is it Tuesday or Wednesday, Donald? I can't remember. It's what Wednesday. Day it is. It's you Wednesday. Were right. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I've been so busy. I don't even know what time it is. What day? That's it what is. kind of week it's been. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm actually I'm working early mornings at CNN this week, and as a result of that, I get it's really really early mornings, and I get a little confused about what's going on around me. <laughs> In any event. I am Jason Evans. I'm here with you, as you heard just a moment ago. My buddy Donald Wine is here as well. We had to get this done, so Sam Klein cannot join us for this one, but um, I'm sure we will have time on a future podcast to talk to him about this. So here are the two big pieces of news that are going on right now. I guess you could almost say it's three pieces of news. One is that it's sort of starting to look a little bit more like Trevor Keels is going to stay in the NBA draft, <laughs> that he's not going to be coming back to, that, back to Duke. We're not sure. We don't know. We'll talk about it. Number two is that Duke has a visit going on right now. At this moment, A.J. Green is on campus. A.J. Green, someone we, we've discussed a few different times in this podcast. He's considered one of the better players in the transfer portal. Um, he is a, uh, a shooting guard. And if Trevor Keels is not coming back to Duke, A.J. Green would seem like a really, really nice fit with what our roster is. And then the third piece of news and the thing that sort of turn this from a, hmm, should we maybe talk about this stuff into a, we got to hop on and talk about this right now, is this, it is that Joey Baker has announced that he is entering the transfer portal and Joey Baker will, um, in all likelihood, will not be returning to Duke for his super senior season, his fifth season. He instead will be looking to transfer someplace. And Donald, that's where the conversation really has to begin. We, we had, you know, I, let me frame it to you this way. I'm both shocked and not at all surprised. <laughs> I'm surprised. I'm you're surprised. surprised. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in this sense, and I think this is what you're getting at. I'm surprised in the sense that, you know, a month ago, we had a pod where we talked about how he announced that he was coming back and he had had the hip surgery. And it was right, I guess, right at the, uh, uh, the banquet where he announced that he was coming back for uh, another season. And we were, we had a whole podcast where we talked about how he was going to flow into the team being the leader and being one of those guys that he who accepted his role as a leader from the bench and not getting in a lot of minutes and that it seemed like he'd embraced that role. So I'm surprised that it's taken another month for him to decide, oh, uh, in fact, I am going to graduate. I He did graduate uh, this past week. So congratulations to him on that. That's awesome. actually actually I, I should correct you. Um, Duke in their press release the, today Joey may have walked. I'm not sure if he walked or not. I believe he did. He did walk. He did, he did walk. walk. He, he actually technically hasn't graduated. He's got a couple more classes to finish up. He's going to be finishing up this summer at, at Duke. Um, but, but, but you're right. He, he essentially has graduated. Yes. Yeah. Cause I, I saw the picture with him and uh, Carlos Boozer who also graduated uh, uh, over the week. Uh, last congrats weekend, to Los, so. by the way, I congrats love Los, guys yeah. come back so, and get it done. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think with that, right. He becomes a grad transfer at this point and the the surprising thing for me is that he waited until after May 1st because May 1st was the deadline for players to enter the transfer portal and not require a waiver to play next season. Joy Breaker, even though he is a grad transfer, he has declared after that point. So it's surprising to me that he would do that knowing that it may limit where he ends up going uh, in the long term because a waiver does have he does have to obtain a waiver to be able to play at another school next season. So here's the thing I'll say about the waiver. Um, the NCAA has been handing these things out like candy lately. And the NCAA, we're in an era of player empowerment uh, in, in ways that probably none of us could have imagined even a year ago. And I think the, N the last thing the NCAA wants is for them to be seen as stopping a guy who, um, who has graduated and, and would seemingly be you know, instantly eligible for a transfer because of the fact that he's graduated and a guy who's coming from a program where um, his, his coach, his longtime coach has left and he's with a new coach. Granted that new coach is someone he knows, but that coaching transition that Duke is undergoing right now is one of the reasons guys tend to get waivers um, and tend to get them um, granted by the NCAA. I just don't think the NCAA really wants 
to get in a situation where it looks like they're stopping Joey Baker in what would be his last season. Like if they stop him from playing, then his career is done and he doesn't play anymore. It's not one of those situations where they would be like, no, you know what? You got to sit out for one more year and then you can play. This would be it because Joey would be out of eligibility. So I, I don't think the NCAA is going to get in his way. I think the waiver is, is something. Uh, the fact that Joey did this without even really talking about the fact that, oh, I need to get a waiver and oh, I got, you know, I think they know. I think Duke knows and I think Joey knows that this isn't going to be that big a deal for him to get a waiver and play wherever he wants to. So let me get back to very quickly why I am both shocked and not surprised at all. I'm shocked for the very reasons that you mentioned, that Joey announced he was coming back, that we had this uh, situation on his senior day where he didn't play and where we all said, oh my gosh, you know, this has to, you know, he has to be coming back. Duke has to honor him at some point and he's clearly coming back. So, so I guess I'm shocked because what, it, what all this says to me is that Joey and Duke had a plan in mind a few weeks ago and that plan has now changed. Um, I'm not shocked in that I think that it is pretty clear that Joey Joey got the, got the impression, and Joey may have spoken to John Shire about this, Joey was not going to be the starting, a starting wing for Duke next year, um, and that Joey was maybe going to face you know somewhat limited minutes again in terms of playing time opportunities. I don't know how limited they would have been. And this naturally leads us into the conversation about AJ Green and Trevor Keels. So maybe we need to go there right now. But I think, I think regarding Joey, he saw the writing on the wall. I think he, I think he gets a very distinct impression. And, and I'll go ahead and say it right now. I, I, I think that this is a sign that Duke feels extremely confident, either that Trevor Keels is coming back, or I think the or is way more likely that AJ Green is going to be committing to Duke. And that Joey went, wait a second, my playing time opportunities are not going to be what I thought. What do you think about that, so, Donald? I, so I, I agree with you there. I just don't agree on the fact that it took this long for him to realize that because Joey Baker's a smart man. Um, again, he has a he will soon have a, a piece of paper from Duke University that says he's a graduate. Um, this None of this has changed in the last month. Yes, AJ Green is on campus today and people are trying to connect A to B, but I, I don't think that that was the straw that put him over the top. And that's why I'm a little bit surprised that it's coming at this point in the off season and not a month ago when he could have said, you know, at the banquet kind of get, been given a senior send off at the banquet saying, Hey, I'm about to graduate. I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take another year here. Cause remember, you know, we've talked about this many times on this podcast. He, he had a, he was supposed to red shirt. He came early. He was supposed to red shirt. He didn't end up red shirting. Uh, that year, uh, his freshman year. And, you know, he's had a lot of injuries that have kept him out uh, of a lot of games over the course of his career. When he's been in, he's been great. And he's been a model citizen. He's been a great leader for Duke. And honestly, like I said, I think it's very important for people to recognize one of the best jobs that anyone on this team did last year is him deciding that he can be a leader even though he's not going to be in the game more than five to six minutes a game. Like that is a very big ask for a senior to say, you're not playing, but you still need to step up and lead this team. And he was able to do that in the ways he, that he did. So uh, I, I think, you know, Duke fan, and, and Duke fans love him. I think he's leaving with his head held high. The, the program is wishing him well. And I think all fans are going to support him wherever he goes. I just found it surprising that it came today. So, uh, two two other things I'd say about this before we get into the Trevor Kills and AJ Green conversation, which we are going to get to, and I, I'm I'm betting that most folks who are listening are sort of like, yeah, yeah, get on with that stuff because that's potentially more significant. Uh, first of all, and look, we are we are Duke fans. We love all the players, but I'm going to push back on you on something. Joey Baker was a disappointing player in a Duke uniform. Joey Baker never averaged more than 12.1 minutes per game in his Duke career. This is a guy who, when he was recruited, now he reclassified, so it affects his recruiting ranking a little bit. But when he was recruited, he was a top 20, top 25 recruit in his class. Again, he reclassified. That knocks him down a little bit in the rankings. But for a guy of his high school pedigree, you would have expected him to develop into more than a, this past season, he was 12 minutes per game, four points per game. And frankly, as we saw, he did not play. He was not a, 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 a he did not contribute on the in games for Duke, basically in the final 10 games of the season. 
And his career, there's no way to say it. His career is not what anyone would have expected it to be. If you go back to the day that Joey Baker committed to this Duke team and you find our podcast that we did about him, I'm certain that we expected far, far more than what we got from Joey Baker. I don't blame him. Look, not everybody turns out to be the player they were expected to be. The annals of college basketball are littered with guys who don't turn into what you expected, don't even turn into close to what you expected. And I fully expect that Joey's going to go to a mid-major kind of school, and I think he will be an impactful player at that school. I don't know that he's going to be 15-plus points per game, but I think Joey's going to be a good player, a good shooter, wherever he goes, and I wish him all the best. And he will always be a beloved Dookie. He spent four years here giving us his blood, sweat, and tears. And I, I, I love him to death for that. But let's be clear. I don't think Joey was going to play. I think Joey recognized he wasn't going to play a huge role on next year's team. And, and I yeah, think I agree with that, too. Yeah, I, I agree with that, too. But I, I also think, again, this is not a revelation that came yesterday for him. I think this was something that was I mean, we have it's not we've been talking about A.J. Green and courting A.J. Green for the last month and a half. You know, this is not something that came out of nowhere. Baylor Shireman, we, we've gone after guys that have played his position this entire time. And I don't think that part was a revelation. So that's why the timing is a, is a bit off for me. Not, and I don't say that in a bad way. I just, I'm just wondering what the, what the reasoning full reason was for the time, for the timing. But I do think he knew that he wasn't going to get a lot of playing time, but I thought at this point that he had embraced that role. It seemed like he wants to get playing time elsewhere, which he's definitely entitled to. And I definitely wish him the best for that. I, I think, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Hey, you can tell this is an emergency podcast because the, uh, <laughs> the, yep. yeah, the, the, the police the sirens are out the streets of knew. the streets knew we had to jump on and talk about this <laughs> all right so let's let's move on from joey there's not a lot more to say um about joey beloved player who perhaps never got to what he was going to be and and i, I actually you know i there's a piece of me that wishes he he would have gotten next year i think he it would have been interesting to see what kind of a role he could have carved out for himself on next year's team and and i, I was the guy who kind of said if duke has to roll with with Joey Baker uh, at the two guard, you know, if we don't get anybody else, um, actually what we would have done, we would have moved, I think, Derek Whitehead to two guard, Joey would have played shooting, but uh, would have played small forward. But regardless, if Duke had to roll with him, I don't think it would have been a disaster, but, um, but Donald, we need to, we need to get to AJ Green. Real quick. uh, I will say this, this, you know, uh, the transfer portal thing, we've talked about how it's really kind of uh, revolutionized college basketball and has been a new era of sorts. Um, entering today, Duke was one of only 11 teams that had yes. not had a player enter the transfer portal. We are now off of that list, obviously. But I mean, to last this long and be and honestly be one of the, the best teams in the country and to not lose a player up until this point to the transfer portal speaks volumes about what has been going on with the transition. Everyone's kind of been on the same page uh, and everyone's kind of said, hey, I'm either you know going to the NBA draft, obviously, or I'm staying to fight for my role on this team. All right, so let's let's move to the guy who um, uh, everyone at Duke is sort of buzzing about today because um, a little bit surprising that he, he he's on campus right now taking a visit, and that is A.J. Green. Um, A.J. Green spent the past couple days at the uh, G League. Um, they call it the G League Elite Camp. Essentially, it's the G League Combine. Uh, what the NBA does is they – there are a bunch of guys that they invite to the NBA Combine for the NBA draft, and these are the players that they think – you know, the, the teams say these are the guys we're most interested in for the NBA draft. Paulo Bancaro is there. AJ, uh, AJ Griffin, you know, I, Mark Williams, all the Dukies are there, um, as well as a bunch of other names that you're going to hear called at the NBA draft in the middle of June. Uh, AJ Green was not, th- 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 there, there's some guys who don't quite get to that level. And the NBA says, you know what? We want to invite you to a G League combine where. You will work out against other guys who probably you're all going to, you're probably like G League players, but there may be some of you who are good enough to make it to the NBA combine. And AJ Green was one of the guys who played really well in the G League combine. Um, And he just wasn't quite, there were, there were seven guys at the G League combine who got, who got the bump up. They got an invite, stick around and go to the regular NBA combine where you'll compete against guys who are, you know, legitimately first and second round draft picks. And AJ didn't quite get that invitation. He was probably, you know, sort of just on the bubble of a guy who didn't quite get there. And generally the guys who are thinking about coming back to school, if they can't decide 
and they don't make it to the combine, that's sort of the NBA saying, hey, buddy, you ain't quite there. You need another year. And so the speculation on A.J. Green, because he did not get there, immediately turns to, okay, well, where's he going to go to school if he decides to transfer? And A.J. Green has announced, he has said he's considering two programs. He's con- he, he played at Northern Iowa. He is now considering Iowa State, and he is considering Duke. Iowa State is, of course, where his father is now an assistant coach. His dad's been an assistant coach there for more than a year. A.J. stayed at Northern Iowa when his dad went to Iowa State. Um, So he doesn't necessarily follow his dad around everywhere. But he's now taking a visit to Duke. And, boy, there's a lot of buzz that this guy is going to be very, very interested in Duke, assuming Trevor Keels doesn't come back. Uh, Donald, I could get into all kinds of stuff about A.J., I, I got some stats from his from his G League workouts, by the way. They, they did a, a three-pointer drill, and he hit 68% of his three-pointers in this drill they did. They did a, um, a drill where, where you took like shots off a pass, you know, about 15 to 18 feet. He hit 85% of his shots in the mid-range there. Uh, so he, 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 he was really good at this G League camp. And um, I actually think this is kind of the ideal scenario for Duke, a guy who isn't quite good enough for the NBA but is, but could be really good if he ends up being in a blue devil uniform. Yeah. And I didn't need the speculation about whether or not he's going to re- withdraw from the draft. The only speculation uh, that that was put to rest when I heard that he was visiting campus today, because you don't take campus visits when you are on the verge of possibly going to the NBA draft. That's just not, this is not the order of events here. So I think, you know, for people who are asking, will he stay in the draft? I think the answer is no. I think he's going to withdraw himself at some point. And now that he's taking campus visits, it's only a matter of time before he announces where he's going to go. I think this would be great, uh, you know, a great pickup for Duke. And honestly, I, I think some people have also said this, and, I, and I, I agree with them, that this doesn't necessarily mean that the door is closed on Trevor Keels. I'm not saying that Trevor Keels is coming back. I think I'm the one guy on this, on this pod who has said from the beginning that when he left, I was like, consider him gone. But just because we get AJ Green, doesn't mean that AJ or that Trevor can't come back as well. Um, there's going to be, I think there'd be some shuffling around, but I think that can work out. We still have another scholarship left to honor for him. So uh, when it comes to AJ Green, though, AJ Green can shoot the ball very well. I think we we saw last year having a guy who can shoot the ball very well in the perimeter is going to change how your team flows and how people defend against you. Uh, and being able to have that and also, again, having AJ Green and, and even Jaden shoot coming off the bench. Like, yo, if we can have those guys shooting threes and shooting threes at a clip anywhere close to 68%, I'll take, I'll take 40%. Um, but if you have any, if you have anything in that range, then that means again, you're stretching the defenses out. People have to guard guys tighter. And that means there's more passing lanes and more cutting lanes for guys to go to the hole. And we have plenty of guys that can take the ball on the ground and take it to the rack hard. So uh, this is what I like about, AJ Green, I think he'd be great. And hopefully it's like the NFL where we don't let him leave without a commitment. That's, that's how I see it. I I just, I don't think there's at all of a likelihood that, that Trevor Keels and AJ Green come to Duke. I think it's one or the other. I hope it's one or the other because now that Joey Baker has left the it's Duke would be in a little bit of a, of a tough situation. If neither one of those guys come back, um, uh, AJ Green, I think, would be a, an outstanding fit on this roster. Uh, as as you said, and as I pointed out, a guy who really knocks down three pointers. I mean, last year playing from Northern Iowa, he was the Missouri Valley Conference Player of the Year. I want to repeat that, by the way. Missouri Valley is a very good mid major. He was the best player in the entire Missouri Valley Conference, the player of the year in the Missouri Valley, averaged almost 19 points per game, hit close to 40% from three, hit 91% of his free throws. At, at, at Duke, he is he will not be the conference player of the year, <laughs> and he is going to. But get it doesn't need lot. to be. He, no, exactly. He's going to get a lot more open looks, and the prospect of a guy who can knock down shots like this getting open looks is something that makes me tremendously excited. I, I think he's a, an ideal fit for our roster, and to move it to Trevor Keels for a moment, you know, it's still possible that Trevor could pull out of the draft. But a lot of the stuff that has happened in the past few days makes it feel like eh, not too likely. Um, First of all, Trevor announced that he's not going to be participating in five-on-five drills at the the NBA Combine. 
that's not a huge surprise. Most guys, Trevor is, you know, still projected, you know, somewhere between like 25 and 35 or 40 in the NBA draft. That's where most people have him. Um, and guys projected in that range typically don't take part in the five on five drills because the other guys in that range aren't taking part in the five on five drills. And the last thing you want to do is go into like, he doesn't want to play with guys who are ranked outside of the top 50, because if he does, and he's not better than all those guys, and suddenly those guys are moving ahead of him. There's no one for him to, like, you don't want to play against guys who aren't ranked better than you. And there aren't going to be guys ranked much better than Trevor Keels playing in the five on fives. But typically, you know, guys who pull out of the five on fives, it's sort of a way of saying, I feel fairly good about my situation. I don't feel like I need to impress NBA teams. They already know what they know about me. So that's the first thing about Trevor from the combine. And then the other thing is last night, they had the NBA draft lottery. And all five Duke players, Paula Bencaro, yeah, uh, Mark Williams, Wendell Moore, AJ Griffin, and Trevor Keels were in attendance. They sat together. ESPN, you know, th- th- there are pictures of them on the air. Um, and they were putting up graphics on the screen talking about, you know, five teammates being first round draft picks. Boy, the, 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 the way it was being played last night, it sure sounds like Trevor Keels is not pulling out of this NBA draft. Yeah, and, and again, I I, I kind of suspected that this was going to be the case, but I also say this, right? Like, they were front row, right? Like, there was the top three players in the NBA draft, right? Or the, 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 the guys that everyone expects to be the top three picks. Chad Holmgren, Jabari Smith, and, and this is in no particular order, and Paul Bancaro. They were sitting next to each other. And then on the other side, of Paulo Bancaro are the other four Dukies that have declared all in one row, front row, center. And again, after the interviews and stuff, all the cameras, all they focused on were those five guys. And they had, I think some people saw the pictures on social media. They all were dressed to the nines. They all look, all look fantastic in their suits. Um, and they looked like draft picks. They looked like guys who were staying in the draft. So, and also Jason, like you said, pulling out of the five on five doesn't necessarily mean that they have a guarantee of any sort. So let's let's make that well known. Right. But it does mean that they feel fairly confident. And also, this isn't the only time that teams are going to see them. Teams can bring in guys for individual workouts. You'll see some guys like to call in. And, and you know, for, for case, for example, last year, the Pistons only brought in Kate Cunningham for a private workout because they had the number one pick and they just wanted to make sure that his legs weren't falling off. Once he did that, they picked them with the number one pick. So you're going to see guys going to different teams, doing individual workouts, and they can be able to impress on an individual level and, and make it where they go. Hey, what are you, what are you thinking about me? What is the situation here? And I think at the end of the day, it seems like that process has already started for Trevor Keels. And I think he's gotten enough to say, yo, I'm going to ride this thing out see where it takes me. If you act like a first round draft pick, if everyone else acts like you're a first round draft pick, you're probably a first round draft pick. And I think that's what Trevor Keels, that it feels like that's what's happening. Act like you're Trevor supposed Keels. to be there. No one yeah. lets you, everyone lets you through. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So, so I, I think that's where Trevor probably uh, is going to land with his decision. And it feels really good that as, as it looks like he's trending away from returning to Duke, we've got AJ green who, who it looks like is trending um, on his way toward coming to Duke, by the way, really quick on the NBA combine. I do want to mention that the combine started today. And uh, the first thing they do with all these guys, not every single one of them, like Paula Bancaro, I don't think is going to get measured. Um, but very, very top picks sometimes don't get measured. They're sort of like, no, you don't need to see anything else about me. <laughs> but almost everybody else gets measured. They get their wingspan and their height. You know, how tall are you in shoes and without shoes and all that other kind of stuff. Um, and as the measurements have been coming out today, There are a couple of things that have jumped off the page. I'll give you the first one. Mark Williams. The measurements of Mark Williams. People are like, whoa. Mark Williams came in with a standing reach of 9.9. I want to tell you how big 9.9 is. 9.9. There is a 10. (laughs) The second best standing reach at this year's combine goes to Walker Kessler, who was 9.5. So... Now, he was four inches longer than Walker Kessler. I mean, Mark came in big, and, and people are talking about it. The other thing about Mark was he came in with a body fat percentage of 5.4%. That's absurd. That means Mark Williams 
is in really great shape. He is not carrying any fat at all. 5.4% is the kind of number you see on like a lightning quick point guard or shooting guard. It is not that, a number you, you, you that don't man see. Is, that man is not on the cookout diet. That is for sure. <laughs> no, that is not a number you see on a big man. I mean, by comparison, Walker Kessler had a 14.7% body fat. Drew Timmy had a 15.7% body fat. I mean, Mark Williams's numbers were stunningly good. And everybody is now saying, dude is not only is dude a lottery pick, there's a lot of talk that he's going to go in the top 10. Top 10. Yep. I've seen those recently. Also, uh, I will note that last night uh, they had the interviews with um, Jabari Smith, Chet Holmgren, and Paula Bancaro. And standing with them was David Robinson. David Robinson, friend of the pod, son, friend of the pod. Like David Robinson is a legit seven feet zero. He oh, is yeah. seven feet tall. Chet Holmgren was a little bit taller than him. He was like seven one. But you know who was right there with him? Paulo Bancaro. Paulo Bancaro is no longer six ten, ladies and gentlemen. That man is closer to seven feet tall, and that's not with the hair that's sticking up an extra two inches. <laughs> because when you looked at all of them, Jabari Smith. I mean, uh, take out the reporter, but the, Jabari Smith was the shortest of the four guys standing up there. Um, and Jabari Smith is also legit six ten. So. Uh, Paulo Bancaro is basically like, yo, I know there's not going to be no issues with people thinking I'm shorter than I am or playing smaller than I am. That man is legit 6'11", possibly seven foot. And we saw that this year when we saw some pictures of Mark. We talked about this earlier in the season with Mark Williams and Paulo Bancaro next to each other. And we go, okay, either Mark Williams is 7'2", or Paulo is seven feet. One of those is true. The other is the other guy is not who they think they are, who, as tall they say they are. So um, I, I, there's, I mean, there's going to be a lot of these measurements coming out and people are going to scrutinize them. But the end point is this, you want your measurements to be better than expected. And if they are, that means you're, you skyrocket up lists. And that's what Mark Williams is doing because of his measurements coming in. He has done nothing other than be, be measured and weighed and have the, have the little body fat, little, little pincher thing. That's it. And now he's gone from, ah, he's probably a lottery pick to that man is secured in the top 10 at this point. Hey, so let's talk really quick. So, because we got the lottery results, um, Donald, we did. Hey, g- g- give me, give me your projection if you can, really quick. Because the top of the lottery, really, you know, which teams are there matters in terms of who takes who. Where do we think Paula Bancaro is going to end up? Yeah. So let me quickly go through the uh, top five because that was the the big you know order really. Because you're talking about most people are considering this draft like the top four players are kind of uh, or top three players are kind of leaps and bounds above the rest of uh, the pack. But well, there, there, hey, there are people I'll tell you, it's tough. There are a lot of people out there who think Jaden Ivey is a, a pretty special player. Yes. Oh, I, I, I am one of them. Remember, I, I went to high school with his dad, so I've, I've seen him since he was a little boy. Um, and that man is, is really ready to take on do highs. And, and funny enough, I'm hoping that he slips in this draft. And I'll tell you in just a second why um, the top five Orlando Magic won the lottery. Um, OKC Thunder um, gets second pick. Houston Rockets, who had the second pick last year, uh, get the third pick this year. The Sacramento Kings moved up into the top four. And as I mentioned, the Detroit Pistons, uh, who had a top three chance, uh, drop a little bit to number five. So there's your top five. That is why I want Jed Nivey to slip, uh, because if he can slip to five, he is not getting passed by Detroit Pistons. I will say that. All right, so uh, so I asked the question. I'll ask it again. Where do you think Paulo goes? Mm-hmm. I, I don't think Paulo's going to go number one. I think Orlando. I, I feel Orlando's like, going with Chet. I think. I think. I I, I agree. Which, which is, would, by the way, will be an interesting situation for uh, Wendell Carter, who who is a big man for Orlando. Although I think he and Chet Holmgren can play together pretty nicely. But but yeah, I agree. I think I think Orlando's taking Chet first. Yeah, I I think I honestly think Paulo Bancaro ends up in Houston. And I think that actually might be the best landing spot for him out of the top three. Um, pairing him with Jalen Green, I think both of them, uh, both again, both can bring the ball up and they'll be called to do that at times and both can take the ball to the hole. And, and, and then I think Jaden Green, Jalen Green has a little bit of a better shot than Paulo Bancaro, but both those guys will be able to take over games at certain points. So I think Houston will probably be just absolutely ready. They'll turn their card in immediately if Paulo Bancaro is available at three. Yeah, I, I, I think it, I also think it's kind of likely that Paulo goes number three, but I mean, I, I could, I could see him going second. Um, 
it, 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 frankly, these three guys are so close together and, and it really depends on whether a GM wants to, I think you roll the dice a little bit more with, uh, with Jabari Smith and, and Chet Holmgren than you do with Paulo Bancaro. Paulo has the highest floor. There's little question that his skills will translate almost immediately to being an impactful player in the NBA. Um, the question is, do you feel like maybe the ceiling, um, I, I'm certain that the ceiling on Chet Holmgren is higher because he's such an elite rim protector and he has such unique skills. I don't know if the ceiling on Jabari Smith is higher than Paulo. It's hard for me to tell, but you know, different teams may see different things and, and evaluate different things from these guys. Hey, Donald, so we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, what does $12.5 million buy you? How about the GOAT? That's what it gets you. More on that in just a moment. All right, so we're back from the break, and, and Donald, we're going to be very quick on this topic, but I do want to bring it up because a lot of people are talking about it. It was announced um, just yesterday that Duke University paid Coach Mike Krzyzewski a little more than $12.5 million in 2020 to 2021. That's according to the school's federal tax filing. Um, Duke is, of course, a nonprofit, and they have to release you know, salaries of, of highly paid people at the nonprofit, and the highest paid person <laughs> far and away was Mike Krzyzewski. Donald, before I get your reaction to this, I do want to bring up a couple interesting statistical things that I noticed about Coach K's $12.5 million salary, which, by the way, uh, made him the fourth highest paid coach in all of America. Not in college, all of America. That includes all the pro coaches, all the NFL, NBA coaches. Coach K making $12.5 million in 2020, 2021 made him the fourth highest paid coach in any professional sport. Uh, he, he was in college, by the way, he was at Kansas's Bill Self, made a little more than $10 million. Nick Saban made a little less than $10 million at, at Alabama. So Coach K was pretty, uh, more than $2 million clear of Bill Self as the highest paid coach. But here's the thing that's interesting about it. It's not that Coach K's salary was $12 million. His, his base compensation was only $3.2 million. Um, most of what he earned was a, a huge seven plus million dollar bonus kind of thing, a deferred payment that he got, not a bonus. It was a deferred payment that coach K, that coach K landed. That's, that's where the numbers really shot up was in this deferred. So essentially what we had was coach K had not taken salary as high a salary in past years. They deferred it to this one year and then it all came in one big lump sum. So a lot of people are talking about this. They're saying, how can anyone make this much money? Donald, what do you think? Uh, I'm surprised it's not less. And if you think about it, um, Jason, the, the Chronicle had some other numbers too. They kind of broke it down uh, specifically. The 7.2 million that you, you were talking about is in what they call other reportable compensation. That's a lot of different buckets that we're not going to get into. Uh, they also had 1.1 million in non-taxable benefits. And then they had another 1.2 million in retirement and other deferred compensation. So in 2021, his actual total compensation was $13.7 million. That's last year, mind you, not this, not this fiscal year, not this school year, um, his last year. So this is his penultimate season that he got this type of money. And honestly, he's worth every bit of it. Because again, I think what most people don't realize is that a lot of the big you know, public schools, public universities are able to pay all of that. And most of that is in base salary, not in this other, you know, deferred compensation and all that, because they have the boosters who can, you know, Texas can write a check. One guy can write a check for, for the coach. They also have coaches that are sponsored and they have all these other things that they do to make it where they can afford to pay high salaries. Duke as a private university doesn't necessarily have, yes, the, of course they, you could, as you can see, they have a lot of money to pay a basketball coach, but they have to, they have to source it in other ways to make it where the numbers balance uh, when it comes to financials. So uh, I'm, I'm totally on board with this. I'm totally fine with this. And here's the thing now is, you know, we'll start to see in the next, in the coming years, what John Shire's salary is going to be. So it is, uh, I mean, it's going to be a, a healthy pay cut for, at least for Duke fans. You're going to see that number go way down, but there's going to be, if you see this, a lot of incentive con uh, compensation. So I mean, if, if next year's is a lot higher or this, this past year's a lot higher, 
is because Coach K got to the Final Four. There's probably a lot of other things that came to play, so I'm totally fine with it. By the way, it's uh, it's worth noting that the uh, Duke reports they're required to report um, athletic department and specific athletic program uh, revenues and expenses and the such to the Department of Education. And the Duke men's basketball program earned twenty two and a half million dollars during the 2020-2021 season. So if they made $22.5 million, paying the guy who generates that money um, $12 million, it's just not that crazy, especially when you consider that a lot of it, almost you know, most of that was this deferred compensation that came from past years and as such. Uh, d- doesn't seem crazy to me at all. Um, Duke, Duke's basketball program is running far, far, far in the black. <laughs> and when that happens, the guy in charge, he deserves a nice cut. Well, if you think about it, that $22 million was A, profit, and B, does not – I mean, that in, they've already taken into account whatever money they paid Coach K in the expenses portion of that. So, like, yep. revenue brought in minus expenses, including this salary, still yielded $22 million. And keep in mind, Jason, he also has the other outside endorsement money that he gets, like from SiriusXM and all those other things that he uh, – and now AT&T, um, you know, he has that money coming in too. So, you know, you know homeboy – living pretty nice. He's sitting on a pile of money. It's, it's, it's pretty nice. But again, that pile could be as high as he wanted it to be, and it'd still be worth it to me. Well, and, and, and it's also worth noting that the guy gives back tremendously to the Duke community, to the Durham community, uh, to a Emily number K. Of, yeah, to so many different charitable uh, outlets. Uh, this is not someone who's um, trying to uh, pile all, all of his money up into one big room and then uh, just uh, swim around in it like a swimming pool, like a uh, uh, like Scrooge like McDuck. Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> <laughs> Coach K is, is doing really good things with, with these with this with these dollars. I, I've got no problem with it at all. By the way, you mentioned AT and T. Uh, I, I found a little list. Coach K um, uh, also gets uh, you know endorsement money, so to speak, from Allstate, American Express, and Nike. Of course, Nike pays him a, a hefty sum of money. They're, they're you know the people out there who are who are upset about this. They're just being crazy. They're being silly. I mean, the amount of money that coach K has generated for the Duke program, the amount of goodwill he's done for the Duke for Duke university, the amount of extra donations that Duke gets as a result of the amazing basketball program that coach K has built. Yeah. There, there, there's almost no number within reason that you could pay coach K that would seem wrong to me. Uh, His benefit to Duke university. I'm certain that if you tracked it, if you had someone go back over the 40 years Coach K's benefit to Duke University would be close to a billion dollars. I don't think that's a crazy number by any stretch of the imagination uh, in terms of goodwill, in terms of donations and, <clears throat> and everything else that he does for this program and for this university. So, uh, And the success of the program also yields in other forms of the university. It makes people more incredible. I mean, reunions weekend was the weekend after the final four. People come back every year. They write big checks because they're happy about the situation of, of just being back at Duke. And that helps. Uh, I mean, it, say what you want about it. Like sports helps reunite people. It helps unite people and helps reunite people. And, uh, you know, no, a lot of reunions occur with fellow classmates over Duke basketball, where Duke basketball is being talked about or at games. That also helps yield people wanting to go to university because they see have the success of the programs and they want to be a part of that something special that we have here. So it it all, I mean, him having a successful program for 42 years is the reason why a lot of people, myself included, considered going to Duke university and ultimately attended. Like it is, is what it is. So if if that is worth, I mean, in 2019, he made $7.3 million that I would, and I think we were on this podcast, like, yo, we need to pay this man a little bit more because he was like in a top like 40 at that point. Now he's right. in the top three and everybody's upset. No, give that man what he wants. Give that man his money. Yeah, that's going to wrap it up for us here on episode 423 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. We'll, we will be back uh, as soon as there is more news about Duke for, for all of you out there to, to hear us talk about. Um, you know, I, I won't be at all surprised if in the next week we get some more uh, tea leaves, perhaps even announcements regarding what's going on with A.J. Green, what's going on with Trevor Keels. These are key, key roster moves. And we're also going to begin to hear a little bit more about uh, these Duke players at the NBA Combine and what's going on with their draft status. We'll be on top of all of that stuff for you. Hey, folks, and by the way, you can always email us anytime you want. We we are dying for more emails to to put into our mailbag and potentially do another mailbag episode like we have done recently. Email us at dbrpodcast at gmail.com. 
like and subscribe because we want to get those you know it, it, it helps us out with search results and helps other people to find the DDR podcast for donald wine i am jason evans sam klein in abstentia says hi and here's the duke band to play us out and take us home give you a big Labor Day surprise. Most people think if we all exercise the same and eat the same, we'd all look the same. And let me tell you why that's wrong. Your body is unique and your metabolism is unique. I'm Lacey Green and I'm a super trainer at Body. That's B-O-D-I dot com. And you can't see me, but I don't look like your average personal trainer. I'm curvy and I'm proud of it. So I created a program for beginners only on the Body app to show people like us how to get incredible results and be our version of happy and healthy. This isn't just workout videos. It's people like you and me. It's community. It's incredible trainers. It's easy to follow nutrition and mindset experts to help you reduce stress and just feel better. And you can get started with my new program called For Beginners Only. Now, here's the big surprise. If you go to body.com right now, that's B-O-D-I.com, not only can you get everything Body has to offer at 50% off with an annual membership, you'll also get an additional 20% off, but only during Labor Day weekend. Let's do this together. Go to body.com. That's body with an I.com.